Let me begin this morning by making a note about this passage. In some of your Bibles, at least this is the case in my Bible, and I'm assuming in most of your Bibles, there's a notation above these verses that says this, this is what mine says, the earliest manuscripts do not include these verses. I remember being in seminary in graduate school, and as we were making our way through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, our New Testament professor said to us, who were going to one day be preachers, what do you do when you come across John chapter 8? Because there's this notation there that indicates that in the earliest manuscripts, or at least the ones that we have, these verses don't appear. So do we treat these verses with as much authority as we treat other verses in the Bible? And after a long discussion in our class about it, my professor said, of course you do. And he said, this is why. Because the God who originally inspired breathed out the Bible is the same God who sovereignly presided over its preservation. And so what he encouraged us to do was to recognize that if it's here and God sovereignly presided over what we have here, then we can treat these verses with the same amount of authority as we can treat any other verses in the Bible. So I want to say that at the front end because oftentimes if we read, and there are one or two other places where there's a similar notation, and we can easily skip over these and say, well, these must not be as reliable or these must not be as authoritative as the verses that come before it or after it. But that posture fails to take into consideration God's sovereignty and his providence in presiding over the preservation of this, of what we have in front of us. So uh, I wanted to just make note of that because I've had a couple people ask me, uh, what do we do with verses like this where there's a notation in the Bible? We treat it just like any other verse in the Bible. Well, last week we looked at Philippians chapter 2. To get this series started, we looked at Philippians chapter 2 and we examined two radical themes there. We looked at the fact that God came, and I mentioned that, you know, oftentimes we fail to be swept off of our feet by the very fact that God came, and there are a number of reasons for that. I I talked about those in my sermon last week, but we looked at the fact that God came, and what a big deal that is. I mean, for God himself to come down and to clothe himself in human flesh and frailties to clean up the mess that we made is a big deal, a really big deal. It tells us that things are a lot worse, that we are a lot worse than we typically imagine, that for God himself to come, it signals that not only are things worse than we realize, but that he's come determined to set things straight and to make things right. So his arrival is both bad news and good news. We also looked at the way that God came. Philippians chapter two makes it very clear that God did not come riding on a lightning bolt from the sky, flexing his muscles and zapping people with lasers from his eyes, okay? He came in humility and what Philippians tells us is that he not only became obedient, but he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He came to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Well, this week, I want to look at what God came to say. I mean, we're, we're sort of thinking through what it means that God came down. And not only is it important for us to understand that he came, that's very basic and fundamentally important, not only is it important to realize how he came, but what did he come to say? I mean, what did, what did he come to do? Now, we know in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus stands up in the synagogue, and he's invited to read uh, the scripture reading for that day, and he reads from Isaiah, and he essentially reads the portion of Isaiah which says, I've come to set the captives free. I've come to liberate the oppressed. And then Jesus says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I'm the one who has come to set people free. I'm the one who has come to liberate the oppressed. That's what I've come to do. I've come to set captives free. 
We know that that was, in essence, his mission. But what specifically did he come to say? And I think this passage gives us tremendous insight into what Jesus came all the way from heaven to earth to say. The Bible in general, and this passage in particular, teach us that God came to speak two words, okay? He came to speak a word of bad news, and he came to speak a word of good news. He came to speak a word that exposes us, and then he came to speak a word that exonerates us. He came to speak a word of diagnosis, and then a word of deliverance. He came to speak a word of accusation, and then following his word of accusation, he came to speak a word of acquittal. And we see those two things very, very clearly here. We see that Jesus speaks a word that exposes, and then he speaks a word that exonerates. I love this passage because it really does, in many ways, sum up the whole Bible. Because what the Bible does is it exposes us as great sinners, and then it shows Jesus to be a great savior. That is the fundamental storyline of the Bible. The Bible is Jesus-centered. It shows us our great sin, and then it shows us God's great salvation. That from Genesis to Revelation, we see this Christ-centered plot line running throughout. That the Bible tells one story, and it points to one figure, and it reveals to us all that God has done to clean up the mess that we made. All that God has done to fix what we broke. And so, in this passage, we see that, and I want to look just to two things briefly. I want to look at God's word that exposes, and then I want to look at God's word that exonerates. The religious leaders, as you know, were always, always trying to trick Jesus because what drove them nuts, absolutely nuts, was his loving attention to the spiritual riffraff in the world. I mean, they just could not understand why this guy would hang out with such rank sinners, prostitutes and tax collectors and people who were known in society as being woefully sinful. They just couldn't understand it. Jesus did not hang out in the halls of power. He hung out on the on the sidelines of what was important in this world, and he and he hung out with he hung out with castaways. He hung out with people who had been cast out. He hung out with sick people. He hung out with unrighteous people, and they couldn't understand it, and they accused him of being a drunkard. They accused him of being like them. They accused him of being a glutton. They accused him of all sorts of things because he was disrupting the establishment. Okay, the religious leaders of that day had successfully barricaded themselves away from the riffraff of this world so that they could appear more competent, more spiritually mature, stronger than the rest. And Jesus was coming in and teaching with such amazing authority and as a result was disrupting the establishment. So they, Jesus drove these guys nuts and they were always trying to trick him. They were always trying to get him to say something that they could use against him in a court of law. They were constantly accusing him of ignoring tradition, of lessening God's law, of lowering God's standard. Interestingly, you know, Jesus was never ever accused for being a legalist. He was accused for being lawless and licentious, but he was never accused of being a legalist, ever. Interestingly, the Apostle Paul, same thing. He was never accused of being a legalist. He was always accused of being an antinomian, a fancy word that Martin Luther coined, simply meaning against the law. That's what they accused him of. And we would affirm, of course, that the Christian faith is not lawless. It does not encourage licentiousness. But there's something so radical about the gospel that it does cause people to go, wait a second, like in Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul. Now, wait a second. Uh, is, if what you're saying is true, does this then mean that we can sin till our heart's content without consequences? Is that what this means? And of course, Paul says, no, you're mishearing me. 
if that's what you're hearing me say. That's not at all what I'm saying. But there is something about the radicality of God's one-way love. There is something about the unconditionality of God's grace that causes sinful people like you and me to scratch our heads and go, wait a second. Okay, this is, this is a little bit over the top. According to the religious leaders, Jesus was over the top, all right? And so therefore, if we are never accused as Christian people of being over the top, that we lay it up and play it safe so that we can maintain our posture within the establishment, then we're not following Jesus' lead. I mean, Jesus was accused by the good people of being somewhat radical and revolutionary. And so here they drag a woman caught in adultery to Jesus, and they make a statement in the form of a question. Don't you love that? I love when, you know, I'm sure this has happened to you, when, when people ask you a question, it's very disingenuous. You know, when they, they ask you a question and you can just sense that they're, they're not really curious and honestly looking for an answer, they're actually making a statement with their question, they're making an accusational statement with their question. Well, that's what they do here in verse four and five. It says, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? Okay, it's not like they were coming to him going, gosh, what do we do here? Because we love this woman and we want to see her set free from her sin. And so what, how, do we, how do we put together this idea that Moses said this, and yet we're supposed to love sinners? I mean, how do we put these two things together? That was not what was motivating their question, okay? What was motivating their question, I mean, there was no care at all about this woman. No care at all about this sinful woman. They, they, she, was just, she was just, you know, a prop in this moment in order to try and trick and accuse Jesus. They didn't care about her, and so they say, okay, now this is what, this is what Moses said in the law, but what do you say? I and mean, we just caught her. What do you say? Trying to pit Jesus against Moses so that they could say, aha, I told you, I told you this guy is so radical that he ignores the law of Moses and that would be enough to discredit him within the religious establishment. And so their motivation is exposed in verse 6 when it just says very, very plainly, this they said to test him that they might have some charges to bring against him. They weren't looking for an answer. They were simply making an accusation against him. And then it goes on to say something strange. It says, Jesus bent down and wrote something with his finger. And it doesn't exactly tell us what he wrote, okay? I mean, I've been in settings where there's been such speculation as to what Jesus wrote. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically here what he wrote, but it does say that Jesus responds by saying, let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. Okay, so there's got to be some sort of connection between what Jesus was writing with his finger and what he said with his mouth. Now, to sort of get at this, I was thinking through this with a friend of mine this week. There are two places in the Bible that came to mind where God writes something with his finger. Two places. The Ten Commandments, okay? In the Ten Commandments where God writes his law on the two tablets of stone. That's one place. That's obvious enough. But there was another place as I was thinking through this uh, yesterday afternoon. There's another place, Daniel chapter 5. If you want, flip back to the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 5. This is a brand new Bible. Where's Daniel? It's in the Old Testament, right? <laughs> That's good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm, you have, should have such great faith in in your pastor. Daniel chapter 5, this is that uh, famous portion of the Bible where there's this party going on. There's this Babylonian party going on, and uh, a hand out of nowhere shows up and writes something on the wall. 
and kind of kills the mood of the party because of what it says. Okay, I mean, they're dancing and having fun and, you know, it's just a debaucherous party. And then some hand shows up and writes something on the wall and it's like the record player goes, okay, and everyone starts freaking out because of, because of this hand that appears out of nowhere and what it says. So Daniel chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, let me read this. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Verse 5, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand and the king saw the hand as it wrote okay so you get the picture now flip down to verse 24 of chapter 5 i mean yeah of chapter 5 the king's freaking out what's going on okay and he starts summoning people in the kingdom to see can you interpret what this says and he eventually comes to Daniel, okay? And Daniel arrives and uh, interprets what this hand has written on the wall, beginning in verse 24. Then from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, many, many, tekel, and parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now, why is that relevant to this? Okay, here's Jesus writing on the ground. It doesn't say what he wrote, but I think this passage should at least encourage us to ask the question, where else in the Bible does God write with his hand? And Daniel 5 is a famous place where a hand shows up and writes something. Well, here you have the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees coming to trick Jesus, okay? They clearly think that they're better than this woman, clearly, that they are the righteous and she is the unrighteous. And so this, this Jesus bends down, they bring this woman to Jesus, what do you say, okay? And Jesus bends down and writes something on the ground. Well, we can't say for sure what Jesus wrote, but it's clear that his writing and his words exposed the sinfulness of those who accused the woman. I mean, in Daniel 5, you have been, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, okay? The law, the law, every time we find the hand of God appearing and writing something, he writes law. He writes a word that exposes the Ten Commandments, exposes us in all of our sinfulness. The Ten Commandments exposes us as being incapable sinners who can never in a million years save ourselves, rescue ourselves, set ourselves free. And then in Daniel 5, we see this word of accusation. You have been found, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You don't measure up. And as a result of not measuring up, you're in trouble. He writes a word of law. He writes a word that exposes Belshazzar in all of his sinfulness. He writes a word of accusation. And so, at the very least, what we can assume based on every time the hand of God shows up to write something and what Jesus says explicitly in this passage, that when he bent down to write in the sand. It's possible that he wrote, whoever looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery already in their heart. Okay? I mean, it could be that Jesus wrote something that his words explained, that exposed them, to help them to see 
as unrighteous as you think this woman is, you're equally unrighteous. I mean, the very motivation of your heart in accusing this woman, in bringing her to me, trying to accuse me, trying to test me and trick me, that's just as unrighteous before God as her promiscuity. In other words, the Pharisees were prodigious in failing to see the log in their own eye while always pointing out the speck in everyone else's. And so, Jesus here levels the playing field. He levels the playing field. He he not only writes something, but he says something that exposes. He says something that accuses. He says something that shows them their sin and their unrighteousness. I mean, the religious establishment assumed, as we often do, okay, that God is for the clean, that God is for the competent, that God is for the winner, the all-star. And yet what Jesus here shows is that God is for the unclean, that God is for the incompetent, and that when measured against God's perfect law, we're all unclean. We're all incompetent. We're not, there's not a category of winners and a category of losers. When measured against God's perfect holiness, when measured against the standard of God's law, we're all losers. I've said this before, but I remember a number of years ago when, of course, Ted Turner said that Christianity is a religion for losers, and Christian people got all up in arms. How dare he say that about us? We're not losers. Christians are winners. And I want to say, no, he's right. Okay? Now, he may have been saying it as if to separate himself and go, they're losers and I'm a winner. I mean, he said it with such tremendous self-righteousness, of course. So I'm not condoning his tone or his motivation. But the fact of the matter is, Ted Turner was exactly right. I have no problem when people say, the Christian faith is just a crutch for the weak. I say, yeah, of course it is. In fact, I'll even take it a step further. It's more than a crutch for the weak. It's resurrection for the dead. I'm not even weak. I'm dead, okay? I mean, I, I, if weakness would assume that possibly I could reach out and take the medicine that God is offering. I'm not lying sick in a hospital bed just needing God to come in my room and hand me some medicine that I reach out and grab and take myself. I'm dead, okay? That's what sinners are by nature. We come into this world, Ephesians tells us, dead in our trespasses and sins. We are, in other words, losers, not winners. There is one winner, one and his name is Jesus. It's not you, it's not me, and our victory is firmly anchored in what he has done for us, not what we do for him. In fact, as I've said before, Christian growth, the process of sanctification, is not I'm getting stronger and stronger, more and more competent every day. It's I'm becoming increasingly aware of just how weak and incompetent I am and how strong and competent Jesus continues to be for me. That's what it means to grow as a Christian, to increasingly realize that Jesus is the hero of the story, that he must increase, that I must, that I must decrease, that he has come to do for me what I could never do for myself. So, the thing that gets in the way of our love for God and appreciation of His grace is not so much our unrighteous badness, but our self-righteous goodness. That's what gets in the way. That's what kinks the hose. That's what blocks us. You know, when I'm doing well, and I think I'm doing well, and I'm relatively proud of how well I'm doing, I'm proud of my obedience, I'm, I'm proud of the way that I stay away from the bad things and cling to the good things. When when that becomes the rhythm of my life, I start to believe my own press. Well, I needed Jesus a lot at the beginning, but I'm growing now, and I'm becoming stronger, and that means that I'm growing out of my desperate need for Jesus. I was really, really desperate for Jesus at the beginning, but now I'm not nearly as desperate for Jesus, and that's supposed to be a sign of Christian growth, of maturity? You see, In my life, at least, 
The thing that has always blocked my love for God, the thing that has always gotten in the way of my appreciation for His grace is not my unrighteous badness. Oftentimes when I become aware of my unrighteous badness, I, I fall on my face, I become, I'm, I'm reminded again of my desperation and I call out to God for help, for rescue for forgiveness, for those sorts of things. God becomes increasingly important to me as I become increasingly aware of just how bad I am. It's my self-righteous goodness, the, the idea that I'm, I'm actually carrying on, I'm actually making it, I'm actually getting it done, and I'm proud of it. That's the thing that blocks our love for God. That's the thing that gets in the way of our deep appreciation for His amazing grace. You see, the biggest problem facing the church today is not cheap grace, but cheap law. Let me explain what I mean by that. You know, oftentimes when you talk about grace a lot, there's always someone in the room who goes, cheap grace, cheap grace, you're peddling cheap grace. And Um, my response is always what I just said, that the biggest problem facing the church today, the biggest problem facing your life and mine is not cheap grace, but cheap law. The idea that God accepts anything less than the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Cheap law. Lowering God's standard to the place where I can actually get it done. Reduce, this is in fact what the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of lowering God's standard and lessening God's law is exactly what they were guilty of. They were lowering God's standard. They were lessening God's law. They had to in order to believe that they were actually getting it done, that they were actually pulling it off, that they were actually achieving the righteousness that God requires in and of themselves. They were dotting their I's. They were crossing their T's, and this was remarkably impressive to God. And therefore, God would accept all of their hard work and their meticulous rule-keeping. The idea that God accepts anything smaller than the perfect righteousness of Christ is an example of cheap law, not cheap grace. I mean, some think that those who talk about grace have a low view of God's law. It's actually just the opposite. (laughs) The reason we talk about grace as much as we do is because we have an infinitely high view of God's law. And it's God's law that exposes us. It's God's law that exposed them. It's God's law that exposes us. Those who revel in grace are those who have a high view of the law because they realize the bar is so high that they're forced to say, I can't do it unless help comes, I'm ruined. It's the incarnation of Jesus. I said last week that that the arrival of Jesus was a guarantee that none of our self-salvation projects would ever be successful. I mean, why didn't God just send some instructions from the sky if we could pull it off? You know, why wouldn't God just say, okay, listen, you guys are a little off track. Go to the mailbox tomorrow morning at nine, and I'll have a list of instructions there, and if you really work, I'll put a checklist in there, and if you really, really work hard at achieving all of the items on this checklist, you guys will finally get yourselves right. You'll set yourselves straight. As I said last week, the fact that God himself comes, okay, the head honcho arrives on the crime scene, tells us something about just how bad our condition is. There's nothing we can do to fix ourselves. There's nothing we can do to fix our world. There's nothing we can do to fix one another. God himself has to come and do the work that you and I could never do. So Jesus' word of law exposes the religious leaders, and one by one, like the rich young ruler, they walk away. Remember when the rich young ruler approaches Jesus and says, teacher, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus walks him through a whole host of things that he needs to be about, that he needs to do. And this guy proudly says, 
Well, I've done all these things since I was a kid. So I'm in good shape, right? And then Jesus hits him where it hurts. He says, okay, then do one more thing. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the rich young ruler walks away defeated. Sad, the Bible says, depressed, because he knew he couldn't do that, that he could not reach that level. Well, the same thing happens here. Jesus writes something on the ground, and he, he says a word of law that exposes the Pharisees, the religious leaders, for their sinfulness, and they all walk away one by one. Now, it's interesting to me here that it says, starting with the oldest, okay? Now, what? I mean, I was having lunch with uh, Jono, who's one of our professors at Knox uh, on Friday, and, um, and, I, and we were talking about this. You know, what, what does this mean? It's interesting that the Bible would include this that one by one they walked away, starting with the oldest. Well, this is what we talked about. Um, older people tend to be more realistic. Younger people tend to be more idealistic. If you live long enough, you begin to realize you're not as strong and capable as you once thought you were. In other words, in my experience, the older I get, the more realistic I become about who I am. You know, I said this a number of weeks ago, and it's true. I, you know, when I turned 40, I was doing a lot of reflecting, realizing that probably half my life is over, um, and thinking about all, all of the things that I set out to do when I was 25 years old. You know, when God saved me at 21 years old, I was going to conquer the world. And by the time I was 25, I had already come up with a checklist of things I was going to do to transform this world, okay? And, um, and I can remember distinctly being a young man thinking, I'm gonna change the world. And then I turned 40. You know, you have three children, two teenage boys. I'm married for 18 years, two teenage boys, uh, a girl, an 11-year-old girl, or what Kim said the other day, a prepubescent girl. I've never heard that word before. I was like, Jenna was having some little temper tantrum, and Kim goes, be patient with her. She's prepubescent. I was like, you just made that word up, okay? <laughs> but I got the drift, you know? So you live with two teenage boys, a prepubescent girl, all right, 11 years old, married for 18 years. You've seen people die. You've seen people get sick. You've lost family members. You fail enough, and you suffer enough and you fall enough to where you begin to be a little bit more realistic so that now my posture is not, I'm going to change the world. My posture is, I can't change myself. I can't change my wife. I can't change my kids. I can't change you. Thank God for Jesus. A much more realistic approach to life, okay? Well, that's what happens as you get older. You know that. If you're older, you know that. You've buried enough of your friends. You've maybe buried your spouse. You've seen enough suffering in your life. You've gone through enough. You've failed enough. You've experienced enough shattered dreams. You've experienced enough relational tension. You've tried and you failed. You've tried and you failed over and over and over again. And you've lived long enough to experience those things. You've experienced broken relationships and people being disappointed in you and all of those things. You've experienced a hard enough marriage. You've experienced kids who go off the deep end, maybe grandkids who go off the deep end. You've experienced enough to where you become much more realistic and much more open to the idea that God alone saves. That you're not as strong and competent as you once thought you were, that you're not as good as you once thought you were, that you're not as powerful as you once set out to be. I've read this before, and I'm going to read it again because it just fits so perfectly. I love these words. This may be my favorite quote of all time. It was written in an essay by a theologian who's now dead named Gerhard Ferdy, and he was old when he wrote this, just a few years before he died. And it was an essay on Christian growth and sanctification. And he writes, 
Am I making progress? If I'm really honest, it seems to me that the question is odd, even a little ridiculous. As I get older and death draws nearer, I get a little more impatient, a little more anxious about having perhaps missed what this life has to offer, a little more set in my ways, and a little more self-righteous about those whose ways are different. Am I making progress? Well, maybe it seems as though I sin less, but that may only be because I'm getting tired. It's just too hard to keep indulging the lusts of youth. Is that sanctification? I wouldn't think so. But can it be, perhaps, that it is precisely the unconditional gift of grace that helps me to see and admit all of that? The grace of God leads us to see the truth about ourselves and to gain a certain lucidity, a certain humor, a certain down-to-earthness. I think the oldest left first here because they were the ones who were a little bit more realistic about the fact that they were no better than this adulterous woman. I think they had failed enough in their life, that they had experienced enough in their life where they were like, he's got a point. Who am I kidding? You know? I could picture the younger religious leaders kind of digging in their heels and wanting to fight a little bit more for their rights. You know? Fight a little bit more for their self-righteousness. Fight a little bit more to get credit for who they are in comparison to this adulterous woman. But the ones who walked away first were the oldest ones going, you know, I just, I'm not making it. So this is my exhortation to younger people. Don't wait until you are old to pray for the wisdom of the aged. In other words, pray that as a young person, you would be set free from the delusion that you're actually stronger than you are. Take note, in other words, from the older people around you who are more realistic about broken living in a broken world as a broken person with other broken people. In other words, when you're young, learn what it means to cling with reckless abandon to the finished work of Christ. Learn to trust in Jesus with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength as you're young. Not when you get old and life has beaten you to a pulp and now you realize. You know, all of the, all of the people that I interact with, and I, I mean this, this is true, all of the people, not just people in our church, I mean people outside our church, other pastors and theologians and other people, other people that I interact with who have a hard time receiving and accepting the message of God's grace for whatever reason. They use a lot of butts and breaks when they talk about God's grace. They want to qualify it and footnote it and all of those things. I look at them, seriously, they're all in their early 30s. And they all have kids who are not yet teenagers. They haven't been married that long. And they don't have any prepubescent little girls. Okay? all of them. And I want to say, just, this is what I pray for them. I honestly, I say, Lord, be gentle, but make life hard enough and break their knees gently enough, seriously, to where they, to where they recognize your grace in all of its glory. Recognize that they are weak and you are strong. That they stop clinging They stop clinging to whatever they think warrants merit before God. I mean, sometimes I think that people outside the church are more honest about their condition than people inside the church. And this is why people inside the church struggle with this. Because we have this idea that once God saves us, and we are now indwelt, regenerated and indwelt by the Holy Spirit and united to Christ, that what that means is we can now do everything Jesus did. The fact of the matter is our being united to Christ does not mean that we can now do everything Jesus did. It means that we have now received everything Jesus earned for free. That's what it means. Big difference, okay? 
huge difference between those two things. And so, one of the things that the Bible makes so clear is that growth as a Christian is always growth downward. It's always growth into grace. It is always growth into a deeper realization of our sinful condition and God's rich salvation, which is why Ferdy says, can it be perhaps that it is precisely the unconditional gift of grace that helps me to see and admit all of that? That maybe according to the world standards or according to some sort of, you know, uh, man-made tradition, religious standards, I'm getting better? The way we define improvement and what it means to get better, specifically in this country, is not the same thing as what the Bible says, okay? It's not growth toward success, it's growth toward failure. At least growth toward the realization, it's not... Growth is not an encouragement to fail. Growth is an increased realization that you are failing, <laughs> okay? That's what it is. And, and so Paul's able to say with great freedom, I'm the worst guy that I know. And he's not afraid of what you're going to think about him saying that. Because he's been so set free to locate his identity in Jesus and what he's done that it doesn't bother him that he goes on record saying, I'm the worst guy that I know. I'm the least of all the saints. Listen, I've said this before, the world does not need to see our competence. The world needs to hear our confession that we are weak and he is strong, that we are sinners and he is the Savior. That's what they need to see. Don't make the mistake of thinking that what the world really needs to see from the church is a flexing of our muscles. In all honesty, okay, um, I don't know if there are, because this is my world, these, these are my circles, so I'm not, I'm not in sort of the, you know, radical liberal circles out there, political circles out there. Uh, these are my circles, inside the church circles. I don't know if there's any group of people who are more annoying during an election year than Christian people, okay? I'm serious. Now, I, now that's, that, I'm not saying everyone, okay? I'm just saying some of the conversations that I had with people are almost like we have got to show them we mean business. I'm like, like Jesus, right? Okay, by weakness and defeat, he won the victor's crown, trod all his foes beneath his feet by being trodden down, okay? That's gospel. It's what I said last week, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane puts the, puts the ear that Peter cut off of the Roman guard back on and says, Peter, winning this war involves dying, not killing. Big difference, the counterintuitive upside down nature of the way God does business. We win by losing, okay? We, we achieve riches by giving ourselves away like we talked about last week. So God's first word, law, is intended to expose us and show us that none of us are as good as we think we are, that none of us are guilt-free. That's what he does here. He says something and he writes something that sends them away. He turns the accusation around. They come with a word of accusation. Jesus doesn't ignore God's law. Jesus takes it up a notch. He says, let me tell you what God's law is really all about. I came for the unrighteous, not the righteous. I came for the sick, not the healthy. Healthy people like you, scribes and Pharisees, who think you're all that, you don't need a doctor, okay? This, this woman is clearly being made aware of the fact that she's sick and needs a doctor. This is who I came for. And so ironically, he uses the woman the adulterous woman, to say to the Pharisees, instead of her becoming more like you, that would be the worst thing that ever happened to her, you need to become more like her. Huge difference. That just doesn't make sense, and it just makes us mad, okay? Because we're so desperate to cling to some measure of merit. We have to believe we're better than someone in order for us to feel like we matter. We just have to believe that we're better than someone. I mean, Charles Manson deserves hell, okay? Ted Bundy deserves hell, okay? I mean, we have this list of people in our 
minds and our hearts, they're bad. Thank God I'm not like them. Where do we read that? I'm serious. I don't know how we miss this. I mean, that is taken exactly out of the Bible. I mean, Jesus saying, look at the Pharisee over there praying out loud. Thank God I'm not like the tax collector over there. I mean, how many... Listen, that Pharisee lives in you, and he lives in me. We desperately cling to some measure of our own goodness to make us feel like we matter. We're not free enough to admit that I am just as deserving of God's wrath as the worst person who has ever lived. We're just, we're just not free enough to admit it. That's God's, the process of Christian growth is God setting you free so that you would see clearly your own condition and be free enough to admit that. Well, it's God's second word, gospel, that exonerates us and sets us free. Jesus delivers a first word, a word of accusation. And then, after all of the, after all of the religious leaders walk away defeated with their tail between their legs, Jesus then looks at the adulterous woman and gives her a word of acquittal. The word of acquittal always follows the word of accusation. As I've said before, we will never ever realize how good God is until we realize first how bad we are. God's law is intended to expose our badness. God's gospel is intended to expose God's goodness. Okay. So after all the religious leaders walk away defeated by God's law, Jesus speaks this word of deliverance to the adulterous woman, and he says in verse 10, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And what we see here is that God's law is for those who think they're good. God's gospel is for those who know that they're bad. God uses his law to crush hard hearts, and he uses his gospel to cure broken hearts. Now, the order of Jesus' wording here is crucial. He doesn't say, if you go and sin no more, then neither will I condemn you. I mean, he says, clearly, I do not condemn you, therefore go and sin no more. Now, the reason that's so important to understand the order of his wording there is because the mistake that most people make when it comes to God is to think that obedience precedes acceptance. I mean, Christian people are most guilty of this. I am. God will love me if I'm good. God will love me if I do what's right. God will love me if I obey. But Jesus here reverses the order. He reverses the order and shows that forgiveness precedes fruitfulness. We often think that fruitfulness precedes forgiveness. If I'm good enough, then God will like me, okay? Stuart Smalley, remember him, that guy from Saturday Night Live? I'm good enough, I'm strong enough, strong enough, and daggone it, people like me, okay? He's looking at himself in the mirror, terribly low self-esteem. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this is typically what we fall prey to, this, this idea that if I'm good enough, and if I'm strong enough, and if I muster up enough fruit, um, then then God will love me, God will accept me, God will take care of me, that God, that life really is a ladder that I must climb, and that the higher I go and the further I get, the more God will love me, the more God will be faithful to me, the more God will take care of me. But this is precisely what the religious leaders were afraid of. I mean, this is why this was so disruptive to the religious establishment. They were saying, you can't distribute forgiveness full and free or people will get out of control. I mean, you, Jesus, you can't just forgive this woman. You need to stone her, okay? I mean, she needs, she needs to be put to death. You can't, what, what do you think if you just say, woman, I don't condemn you. 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Go and sin no more. Now, do you think that the woman went and sinned no more? There was only one sinless person who ever lived on this earth, and that is Jesus, okay? I mean, he said, woman, I don't condemn you. Now go, sin no more. Don't, don't be an adulterer anymore. But the fact, that condom, the fact that no condemnation precedes Christ's exhortation tells us something remarkably comforting to all of us, and that is when we fail at putting into practice Christ's exhortation, that doesn't change the fact that there's no condemnation. And when we fail, we run back to the fact that there's no condemnation as it fuels our tank to press on and strain forward. So the underlying fear here for the Pharisees and the underlying fear in our life is that unconditional grace will lead to licentiousness. Remember that story I told you? I, I, it's not a true story. I mean, it's a, what do they call it, an urban legend? When Abraham Lincoln was plowing behind a mule that had a horse fly on its butt and his brother came by and flicked it off, and Lincoln said, what did you do that for? That was the only thing that made him go, okay? I mean, that's the way a lot of us live our lives, you know? I mean, we, listen, while attacks on morality will always come from the irreligious, attacks on grace will always come from the religious, because somewhere along the way, we've come to believe that this whole thing is about behavioral modification, and grace just doesn't possess the teeth to scare us into changing. That's what we've come to believe. So d we can't talk about God's one-way love. We can't talk about forgiveness that is full and free and promiscuously distributed to sinners. We can't talk about that, okay? Because, I mean, if we do, there's going to be lawlessness and licentiousness all over the place. We're going to lose control. I believe in grace in almost every area of my life except when it comes to parenting. <laughs> it's the hardest place. Is that not true for you if you're a parent? Is that not the hardest place to embrace grace? Parenting with grace? I mean, I just, if I forgive them full and free, they're going to go, they're going to, it's going to be out of control around here, okay? I mean, grace just does this whole thing is about behavioral modification, we conclude. Grace just doesn't possess the teeth to scare you or to guilt you into changing. But I have never, ever once met a person who is so captured by God's grace and forgiveness that they say, Woo-hoo-hoo, now I can go do whatever I want. Never. To the, the people who go, this is unbelievable. Now I can go do whatever I want. I can sin as I please and still have remission. This is amazing. That's a demonstration. That is proof that they don't get grace. Not that they do. Licentious people are people who need grace more, not less. It hasn't gone down deep and captured them to the point where they're able to say, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. That is, this is the deal. Doing will become instinctive and spontaneous when our hearts become increasingly gripped by what's been done. I mean, fear and guilt does not cause people to do more and try harder. That was the Pharisee's problem. Fear and guilt does not make people do more and try harder. It makes them give up. Legalism produces lawlessness 10 times out of 10. I mean, the proof is in your life and mine, you know? When you're constantly on the receiving end of criticism or accusation, you're not measuring up, you're not doing enough, you're not trying hard enough, I mean, eventually, doesn't that make you just want to give up and get away from that person? I mean, parents, be careful. Okay, I'm getting ready to send my oldest off to college next year, and I realize how tempting it is to rule with an iron fist. I get it, and yet I also know that legalism produces lawlessness 10 times out of 10. 
You ask, I talk to people all the time who grew up in church where rules and regulations were, or Christian schools, where rules and regulations were what was emphasized. They don't want to walk in the door of a church. They don't want to be near Christians. They've given up on the whole Christian thing because they were wrongly taught that the focus of the Christian faith is the life of the Christian and how well we do, not Christ. And the fact that he came to die for losers like you and me. Failures like you and me. They didn't get grace, they got law, and so they've run to the hills. Grace is not the obstacle to obedience. It is the catalyst to obedience. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. Charles Spurgeon said, when I thought God was hard, I ran from Him. But when I realized just how kind he was, when I realized just how pursuant his love was toward me, I beat my breast wondering how could I have ignored this one who has loved me so and sought my good. It's the kindness of the Lord. It's kindness that generates change. Well, let me just conclude with this. And this is obviously what happens in John chapter 8. I mean, Jesus gives such great kindness. And as a result, the woman is exonerated. God's one-way love exonerates her, and she gets up and leaves a brand new creature. Um, I was thinking about this last week, and then in my conversation with Jono, we talked about it this week. Uh, remember C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Um, Edmund, remember Edmund? There were four children, two daughters of Eve and two sons of Adam. And Edmund, who was one of the four children, betrays his family. He's so taken by the witch's offering of Turkish delight, it becomes an addiction. It's like what sweet tea is for me, okay? This is what it was. I'll do anything for sweet tea, anything, okay? Um, but Edmund apparently would do anything for uh, Turkish delight, and the white witch the devil figure in the story seduces him with Turkish delight. And so Edmund betrays his family and he betrays Aslan, the lion, the God figure in the story. And there is a law. The white witch rightly points out that there is a law. And it says that the life of a betrayer belongs to the white witch. And Aslan acknowledges that. You're right. There is a law that to anyone who betrays Narnia, they belong to the white witch. Aslan didn't say, well, let's sweep that one under the rug. He held up that law. He said, that's right. I mean, there, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay, he, he upheld that law. And then Aslan offers to die in Edmund's place. A death does happen. It's just a substitutionary death. And he decides to die in Edmund's place, but death can't hold him. Remember, Aslan is resurrected. And then he explains to Susan and Lucy, the two daughters of Eve, Edmund's sisters, he explains to them that what the white witch didn't know is that there is a deeper magic than the law. Remember he says that? He goes, she was, she was unaware of the deeper magic. That the law was right and true, the betrayer must die, but that law was not the final word, it was not the deepest magic. The sacrificial death of Aslan tapped into something deeper, more magical. In the same way, this law, okay, this law speaks truthfully, the woman caught in adultery deserves to die. Jesus doesn't sweep that under the rug. But there is a deeper magic, there is a second word, and that deeper magic is a word that charms our fears. It's a word that says, neither do I condemn you. God's forgiving love is the deepest magic. The Pharisees who clung to the law walked away defeated. But to the woman caught in adultery who clung to God's word of grace, she left delivered. And that's what Advent is all about. It's God coming to deliver sinners like you and me.